Last week, we started this new series called Asking for a Friend. Have you ever had a question you wanted to ask, but you were embarrassed to ask it? You ever had that moment? I've had people that I knew they wanted to be ask me a question, but they were a little embarrassed to ask me, and normally they ask it anyway. Questions like, hey, Brad, are those your wife's jeans? Things like that. <laughs> Things that hurt my feelings. Um, maybe you're a parent, and you've got a young child like we do, a two-and-a-half-year-old, and you go out to eat, and, and you hate to ask in front of your friends, but you ask your wife anyway, hey, did you give our son chocolate, or is that something else on his fingers? <laughs> Things like that, okay? Okay, maybe you'd met, some of you don't have kids yet, but things like that happen. Maybe you've had some questions like that, and, and a few years ago, a new ha hashtag started, asking for a friend. And basically what's cool about this hashtag is you have permission to ask any question at all as long as you end it with asking for a friend. And, and it's fine. It can be the dumbest question ever. Students, if you're going to school, you can ask your teacher anything. Just make sure you end it with asking for a friend. And now your invisible friend is the idiot, not you. That's how it works, okay? Here's a few uh, memes that help you out. Does running away from Monday count as cardio? Asking for a friend. <laughs> Number two, which verse in the Bible explains how to turn water into wine? <laughs> I'm just asking for a friend. Number three, can you divorce your in-laws but keep your spouse? Asking for a friend. My in-laws may be watching, so I'm not going to make any jokes about that one right now. All right. And then lastly, are Soco Donuts part of the keto diet? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest. I'm asking for me, not for a friend. I want to know because um, those things are so tempting, and they are so good. Uh, and you guys eat a lot of them, all right? So I go back there sometimes like, man, I'm, I'm dead. I need a donut. Like, they're all gone. Like, okay. Anyway, so... These are some of the questions. So today we're talking about in the Bible, bless you, um, there's a lot of questions that we may have. And a lot of times as Christians, maybe you grew up in the church or maybe you're new in the church. And we're embarrassed, especially living here in the Bible Belt where everybody acts like they got it all together and everybody knows the whole Bible and can quote it all. And maybe you have some questions that you want to ask, but you're embarrassed to ask it. So today we're going to move to part two of asking for a friend. And today's topic is how do I stop? Or prevent, maybe, an addiction. How do I stop or prevent addiction? Maybe you grew up in a church where you were supposed to have it all together. And I want you to know, we said it last week, SoCo is a church where it's okay to not be okay. Like, you could come in the doors with all your baggage and problems and addictions and struggles, and that this is the place to be. We want you here. Because I'll tell you, even me, the pastor, I got issues. We all have some issues. If you don't have any issues, that's your issue. You're a liar. That's your problem, all right? And we got we to gotta help you with that. So we're so glad that you are a part of this series. And today we're going to talk about this. Today this is a little bit heavier, so I'm going to ask that you would pray with me, that we would just open our hearts and minds, and that you would tune in to what God might want to speak to you. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for an, an, another opportunity just to speak your truth, your word. I pray that our hearts and minds would be open. God, I pray that even though maybe some of us are thinking addiction is, is the guy that's struggling with alcohol, but really the addiction can be anything, anything at all. And maybe we haven't even identified it yet as addiction. But Lord, allow our hearts and minds to be open, God. Allow our toes to get stepped on a little bit today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. So no one wakes up and says, today is the day I'm going to ruin my life. This is the day I've been waiting for. Nobody wakes up and says, today I'm going to get addicted to pornography and I'm going to lose my marriage. Today I'm going to go gamble on some things and ultimately lose all of my money and everything I own. Nobody wakes up and says that. Nobody wakes up planning to lose everything. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12, Paul is speaking here, Paul the writer of 1 Corinthians, and he says this as he's writing to the, the, the new church, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. So Paul is saying this in a modern day translation, just because it's fun and just because it may not be a sin doesn't mean we should always do it. Just because everyone else is doing it, just because it seems innocent and harmless, doesn't mean that it's for all of us. And he goes on to say we shouldn't allow something to master us. Mastered, the word mastered, the Greek meaning for that is to be controlled 
or enslaved to be brought under the power of something. What Paul is saying is sometimes we innocently do things or go places or, or get around certain people. And if we're not careful, what we thought was just a small thing can end up owning us, can end up mastering us, can end up enslaving us. And here's how you know, instead of you controlling the thing, the thing now controls you. Does that make sense? So Paul is talking to these people, letting them know you can't be mastered by things. Would you open your heart today and your mind and not allow yourself to be defensive? And if I ask you the question, what is it that is attempting or has mastered you? Maybe it's not just attempting. Maybe it has mastered you. Maybe it has started controlling you. What is that one thing? What is it that you can't live without? It might not necessarily send you to hell, but it might make life on earth a hell for you at times. What has mastered you? I want to share a few statistics with you. 40 million Americans admit to watching porn regularly. 10% of Americans are addicted to either drugs, prescription pills, or alcohol. 15% of Americans are addicted to tobacco. 2.6% of Americans are addicted to some type of gambling. Americans average over two hours now per day on social media. And some experts believe all Americans have some kind of addiction. All Americans have some kind of addiction. Again, when we think of addiction, we think of the guy who lost everything because of drugs. Or, or we think of, of the girl that got uh, addicted to prescription pills and she lost her family and ended up in rehab. But did you know, even though this list is crazy, that it could also be the fact that, you know, just a few years ago, we were not addicted to our phones because there wasn't much more you could do on your phone than make a phone call. Now our phones are our life. Our phones are what we use to communicate with everyone. Our phones, in many cases, that is our social life. We're watching everyone else's life as our life passes by. It can be all kinds of things. And like Paul was saying, it doesn't always have to be that you're an alcoholic. It could be something very small and very innocent that turns in to an addiction that controls your, your life. Maybe it's social media, pills, pornography, gambling. Maybe it's video games. Maybe it's shopping, personal appearance, alcohol, sexual identity, caffeine, dipping, cigarettes, marijuana, and on and on and on. All of these things, if we're not careful, we move from controlling it to it controlling us. And so here's the real problem. The real problem is simply this. It's idolatry. Idolatry is when we make something else our God. It becomes what we need to function. When God is saying, I want you to need me, we go to other things. We replace the one true living God with something little God that we make up in our life. Isaiah is writing in verse chapter 44, verse 14 in the Old Testament, and he says this. He cut down cedars or perhaps took a cypress or an oak. It's used for fuel and for burning. Some of it he takes and he warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. But he also fashions a god and worships it. He makes an idol and bows down to it. He prays to it and says, save me, you are my god. Isaiah is referencing something that isn't necessarily bad or wrong. He's talking about a tree. But how we, if we're not careful, could even take a tree and turn it into an idol in our life. The very thing that we were using for good began to control us instead of us controlling it. And it takes place uh, an addiction in our life. We get our phones. This is meant to make phone calls and to connect with people. But if we're not careful, it now controls me. I no longer control it. It can be all kinds of things. And I hope you'll open your mind to that today. We fall in love with something that is powerless and dead. Yet we say, like the writer Isaiah says, save me. You are my God. Bottle, save me. Pill, save me. Pornography, save me. Make me feel alive again. Make me feel good again. When God all along is saying, I want to be the source of your joy. I want to be the source of all of your needs in your life. We're seeking to find what only God can provide. Listen, when we go through stressful situations, when we go through pain, when we go through hurt and loss, 
We look for something to fill the void that's left behind. Do you realize that? When we go through difficult seasons, we begin, our flesh begins to look for something to make us feel better. And if we don't look to God, then our flesh is going to allow us to look to the world. And in many cases, we do that. And our flesh and our spirit are battling, and one of them is going to win. Our flesh over here is telling us, love the things of this world. Yet our spirit over here is saying, look to Jesus who died on the cross for you and loves you and wants to give you power to overcome whatever it is you're facing. And we're in the middle and every day we're being drawn one way or the other depending on what we're feeding ourselves and the people around us and the things we do in our life. And I want to help you understand something about addiction. Come up here to pray. Are you here? Come on up here. What we allow to happen is we allow chains to wrap around us. And we're stuck in the middle, and here's what we find. Listen, I need you to catch this. We allow our flesh to go looking for things that make us feel better in the moment. And we said it last week. The Bible says that sin produces death. Sin is fun for a little while, and then eventually it produces death, and it's not fun anymore. And so we look for things, and we allow things to control us. And here's what I need you to get, because the devil, even though I like to call him an idiot and a moron, he, he, he knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing, and here's what you've got to capture. Sometimes we look at addiction, and we think, that addiction, man, it's going to send that person to hell. But you know what? I'm going to be honest. I think many people are going to make it to heaven that have addictions, I think many people are going to be just fine and make it to heaven. So you need to understand the devil is not trying to send you to hell. He's trying to capture you and tie you down so that you don't take anybody to heaven with you. He's trying to get your mind off of the things that God wants to do. And here's what happens when we see these things that tie people down. Come on, we all know someone. We're in the room today. We see people that struggle with things that have controlled them. Maybe it's alcohol, maybe it's, maybe it's a generational curse, and grandpa drank, and dad drank, and now I'm drinking. Maybe it's pornography, maybe it's some things that people try to hide, but eventually we can't hide it anymore. Eventually we start to see the thing that's controlling you. And here's what happens, we begin to lose our witness. We begin to lose the thing that God wanted to use to save your family, to save your friends, and now all we end up doing is scraping by and making it into heaven, but we ain't taking anybody with us. We've lost the power to show people how God can remove the chains of addiction from our life, how the Holy Spirit in a moment can remove something from our life and change everything and free us. Have you ever seen someone who was addicted to something and then they weren't anymore? A few weeks ago, my friend Matt was here. Matt got up. Thank you very much. Good job. Uh, Matt was here a few weeks ago, and he got up and he spoke about a mission trip he went on. My wife and I, we've worked with Matt for years in the church, and we've watched Matt struggle with alcohol. We've, met, we've watched Matt struggle with pills. We've watched Matt struggle with the wrong friends, and we've watched him try to keep his head up, but that thing that controlled him always brought him back down. And we could see all these good things that God wanted to do in his life. But because of addiction, he never could plug into God's purpose. And then one day he made some changes. And then one day he went through some things I'm going to share with you. And then one day he went to an incredible rehab program. And he was here a few weeks ago and he stood up on this stage. And he wasn't hunkered down, controlled by addiction anymore. His head was high. His shoulders were up. And you could tell that God was doing something in his life. And listen, there's some of you in the room today. God wants to free you from the very thing that's holding you back. Some of you in the room today, I believe God can do that. So how do we prevent and how do we get away from addiction in our life? Number one, let me run through these. You have to admit you have a problem. Sounds pretty simple, and you've probably heard it before. Jeremiah 3.13 you only acknowledge your guilt, admit that you have rebelled against the Lord your God and committed adultery, 
against him by worshiping idols. Jeremiah in the Old Testament was a great prophet, and God used him for 40 years to be the voice of God, the spokesman. And poor Jeremiah, it felt like no one was ever listening to him. He continued to speak to the people, and, and it would just fall on deaf ears. And here he is once again talking to the people of Judah and trying to encourage them to find Jesus. And he says, you've got to admit, admit to yourself, admit to your God that you have rebelled against him and that you've committed adultery by worshiping, by letting something come into your life and control you. So we, we tell ourselves we can quit at any time. We tell ourselves when people try to help us get away from me, I don't need them anymore. The enemy gets in your head and says, hey, if they're going to call you out, they don't know what they're talking about. Get away from those people. Go find people that understand you. And so we walk away from the very people that try to help us. We make excuses. I tried to quit and I can't. It's not hurting anyone. I'm a victim. I'm powerless to change. Number one today, I pray that some of you would admit that something's controlling you. Number two, you got to kill your fleshly desire. Galatians 5.16. So I say, walk by the Spirit. Hear this. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other. So that you're, you're not to do whatever you want. This is what we just illustrated. Your flesh wants the things of the world. Your spirit wants the things of God. And every day you're in conflict. The people around you, the things you watch, the things you do, every day it's a battle. And it really wears on us. As the pastor of a church, I'll tell you, it wears on me. So it's okay for you to admit it wears on you. Because we are made up of flesh and spirit. And it's a battle. It's a battle. We have to kill the fleshly desires. Killing an addiction takes two things. It takes the Holy Spirit, and it takes common sense. Think about this. I've been in churches before where they're like, just come up, we're going to pray over you, and, and the Holy Spirit's going to set you free. And I left that place feeling free, and then I went right back to the same life I was living and I fell right back into the same stuff. You have to understand, it takes the Holy Spirit, but it also takes some common sense. Yeah. Parents in the room, you use this all the time with your kids. Hey, if you don't want to do that, don't hang around those people. Yeah. If you don't want to have an F in class, don't sit on the back row and sit on your phone all the time. It takes common sense as well. And God wants us to use our common sense you can't say, you know what, I'm struggling with pornography, um, I didn't really get any filter on my phone or anything like that, but I'm praying a lot now. Okay, well, we got the spirit part, but we got to have some common sense. Yeah. You know, um, I'm still hanging around those same friends that drink a lot, but man, I'm reading my Bible a lot more now. I'm really reading, I got that devotional Pastor Brad was talking about, I read it every morning, and then I go drink with my friends at night. Okay, listen, it takes some common sense as well. Or maybe I got rid of the pills, but I'm not really going to church or getting around the right people. I shut down social media, but now I don't really have friends to encourage and love and pray for me in my life. Listen, it takes some common sense, too, to kill the desires of our flesh. Thirdly, is we have to move our addiction from the darkness into the light. Proverbs 28, 13, whoever conceals their sin doesn't prosper. But the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Did you know that sin grows best in the dark? Yeah. If you can keep it from people, if you can conceal it, if you can make people think everything's okay, you can really, really get that sin to grow. Somebody reminded me before the service how you'll be at home in bed and it's dark and, and maybe you just mowed the lawn and you go to bed that night and you wake up the next morning, you come out and there's like a massive mushroom in your yard. It's growing in the dark. It's growing in the dark. Mushrooms grow best in the dark. Guess what? Sin grows best in the dark. Everybody's asleep. Nobody sees what's going on. It's hidden. Now's the chance for that sin to really grow, to really grow. So what do we have to do? We have to get the darkness and move it into the light. How do we do that? James 5, 16 says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray to each other so that you may be Healed. Everybody say healed. healed. 
Don't just confess your sins so that you can be saved. Because God doesn't just want to save you and take you to heaven. He wants to also free you here on earth. He doesn't want you to live a hell here on earth just so that you can get to a heaven one day. He wants you to know the power that comes with loving him so we confess our sins to each other and we pray so that we can be healed. So how do we get that darkness into the light? We do it by getting around the right people, getting godly people around us. We do it by getting accountability, getting in a community group. We believe in groups here. We're about to start something called Freedom Groups. If you've got something that's been hanging on to you, it's similar to maybe like a celebrate recovery, but it doesn't matter how big or bad it is. If it's something controlling you, we're going to start groups to help people find freedom from those things. We got to get in those groups. We got to get on a team. Let me help you with something. It's really hot up here, okay? So, but I, but I, I want you to know I'm passionate about this. Can you guys, can you guys tune in with me for just a minute? Y'all tune in. Y'all, y'all with me? Just shake your head. I know you're awake. All right. So go church is designed to help people find freedom. We do what we do, and we do it in four ways. Four things we do. Number one, we want to help people know God. So we have a great Sunday service. We, make it, we have donuts and coffee. We have great music. We make it easy for someone to come to church and know God. That's number one. Next thing we want to do is we want to help you find freedom. We believe, based on scripture, if you get in a group, you can find freedom. Groups are designed to have a great time, but they're also designed to help you remove the mask and tell people what's going on in your life. Because the Bible says if you'll confess this stuff going on, you can be healed. you got to confess it to people. And guess what? You probably don't want to go to work and confess it to your boss. I don't, I, don't, I don't encourage you to do that, okay? I, I, most of you probably don't want to go tell your brother about it, maybe. You don't want to go tell your parents, teenagers. So we get in groups and get good people around us where we're safe, and we can say, here's what's going on in our life. So we help people find freedom. The next thing we do is help people discover purpose. Today, right after the service, you can go to Meteor Gallery and go through our next class. We're going to tell you about your gifts we're going to tell you about your personality type. We're going to tell you all about the church and how you play a role in it. And we're going to help you discover that God has a purpose for your life. And fourthly, we say this, we want you to be a difference maker. We want you to go from just knowing God to being a difference maker maker. Here's what happens. You go to next class. You get involved. You start serving on a team here at SoCo. You think, well, yeah, I'll just get on a team. You start practicing serving. Next thing you know, supernaturally, God begins to change your heart. He begins to use you. You begin to find your purpose. You begin to practice it not only in the local church, but in your home, in your workplace, with your friends. God begins to deliver you because you've got good people around you. You're removing the, ba- the mask, and God changes you in a way that you never even expected by coming to the local church. Clap your hands if you believe that. I'm telling you today, I'm passionate about helping people become free. And not just become free, but finding a purpose. Listen to me. I can't tell you enough how much I want to help you make it to heaven and take a bunch of people with you. I want you to take your whole family with you. I want you to take those people around you that you can use a story that God has to change their life. So here at SoCo, we believe that we move things from the darkness into the light, and we do that by simply plugging in to the local church. You know why, you know why it's exciting to be at SoCo? You know why we jump and we clap and we lift our hands? Do you know why we're growing? Because lives are being changed. If nothing was changing, you ain't going to get up and come to this church. You aren't going to come serve. You're not going to go put your kids in child care and serve a service and sit in a service. You're not going to do those things. But the reason we keep growing is because lives are being changed. People are finding freedom. People are finding their purpose and are making a difference. And it feels great. It feels like suddenly I'm not so much over here living for my flesh. But maybe maybe I'm walking in the spirit now. And I kind of like what God is doing and freeing me from this stuff that's been controlling me. And we put a place here for you where God can help you, where God can work in you, and God can use you.
Instead of stuff controlling you and chaining you down, you can control it because you serve a great big God. Let me close with this, the fourth thing. Look to God's power instead of your own. Some of you in the room today, you're like, I've tried this and I, can't, I just can't do it on my own. You're right. You can't do it on your own. God doesn't want you to do it on your own. Listen to me. God wants to use your weakness to show his strength. I talked about my friend Matt. God didn't want Matt to be able to go say, I did it on my own. God wants to use Matt's story to help people know when he was at his weakest, God's strength shined the most. Listen, some of you in the room today, maybe you're feeling weak. Maybe you've tried a lot of things. Maybe you've even tried church and tried God. I pray that you'll practice some of these things because here's the missing piece in a lot of cases. It's true, authentic accountability. Many of us are willing to go do some things, try a rehab, uh, make some changes, listen to a message, but I'm not willing to get real honest with some people who will hold me accountable in my life. And today, I want to encourage you to look to God's power instead of your own. 2 Corinthians 10.3, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, listen to this, we have divine power to demolish strongholds. I shared this passage a few weeks ago. Strongholds is defined as this. It would be like me standing in the same place and you walking by and saying, Brad, why, why, why aren't you moving? Why have you been staying in that same spot for weeks, months, years? And I would say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm in a prison here. I'm in a prison. You're like, well, I don't see any bars. No, 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 it's, it's here, it's here. It's powerless. Yet it controls you. Strongholds. They're simply used to drag you away from your purpose. If the enemy's using it and speaking in your life. He's whispering to your, some of your ears today during this message saying you're never going to change. You've tried everything. It's not going to change for you. This message isn't for you. It's for somebody else. It's for that guy that's really got it bad. It's not just for you. And I'm telling you today, God wants to change your mindset on that. I'll be real clear with you. I have things I struggle with. My wife and I had a conversation this week because this thing it controls me at times. Actually, I'll, I'll be real. Can I just be authentic? I mean, I know I'm supposed to be the pastor and have it all together, but can I just tell you I don't? And then if I'm not careful, I spend more time on this than I do playing with my kid. Can I be honest with you? I was thinking last night as I was trying to sleep about how this past week my little boy was in the room and he wanted to play with me in the room. And as he played, I would kind of talk to him, but I sat there on my phone the whole time. And last night as I was laying in bed, I began to tear up thinking about how worthless that is and how I'm allowing something to control me that's keeping me from speaking into my son's life. It's keeping me from helping him find his purpose and letting him know, man, daddy loves you more than anything in the world. This week, my wife was trying to tell me a story, and I'm in the middle of my phone trying to have a conversation. Instead of taking time, she's right there. Listen, it controls me at times. And I felt very convicted over the last few days as I was preparing this message, thinking, if everybody has an addiction, what would mine be? Never thinking it could possibly be a phone. Addiction's the alcoholic, right? Addiction's the, 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 the person that's lost everything. No, it can also be something that's meant for good that takes control of us. Yeah. It can be that innocent glass of wine with friends. It can be that innocent trip to go buy some new clothes that turns in to spending all the money you have because we're so addicted to our appearance. Likely all of us in the room have something that controls us. And I pray today that the Holy Spirit will begin to work in you and free you from addiction. Whatever the thing is in your life that you can't seem to get past, why do you believe it has more power than your God? I think about David and Goliath. Here's this whole army looking at a giant, enslaved by fear. 
here comes the shepherd boy and says, hey guys, just out of curiosity, what does this giant have that our God doesn't have? Today in the room, what is the giant in your life and what does it have that your God doesn't have? Galatians 5.1, it's freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened against, again, by the yoke of slavery. In John 8, 3, uh, 8, 36, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your Son. Thank you that he frees us. Thank you that there's power there. And maybe we're a new Christian. Maybe we're a long-time Christian. Maybe, we're, maybe we came out of a very traditional, legalistic church, and we're not really sure about all this. But, God, I know one thing. There's power in the name of Jesus. And as we sing today, you make the darkness tremble. And, Lord, today, I know for me this message has been right to my heart, and I believe today, God, that you would love to free some people so that they can clearly see again their purpose, their destiny, and God, they can begin to be a difference maker. I pray that chains would be free, God. I pray that people would be free from bondage, free from the things that hold them back, God.